I'm Bill Robinson, and my talk today is uh, Disillusioning Experience. What I'm going to do is raise a problem for illusionism, and then I'm going to look at three uh, authors who respond to it, three illusionists who respond to it, and uh, I will be arguing that those responses are not adequate and that illusionism leaves us with a mystery. To get started, what is illusionism? I'm going to read three statements from the three authors I'll be commenting on. Uh, first of all, from uh, Francois Kammerer in a, uh, a 2019 paper. Illusionism about phenomenal consciousness is the thesis that phenomenal consciousness does not exist, even though it seems to exist. Uh, Dirk Perboom, in a 2011 book, writes of, quote, ways things are represented that would fundamentally provide us with access to a certain qualitative nature, even if there isn't anything that has this nature. Uh, and finally, uh, Keith Frankish in 2016, quote, it is an illusion to think there are phenomenal properties at all. So now, what are these properties that uh, are not instantiated in our world? Uh, the leading example in these discussions is red, and uh, that's the one I will use. Uh, but of course, uh, any color would do, uh, as would uh, any quality in any of the sensory modalities. Now, when people say uh, bullfighters' capes are red, uh, ripe strawberries are red, or when they sort things uh, by their color. Uh, illusionists are not saying that they're saying something false. Uh, illusionists are not denying that there are molecular surface structures uh, on objects. They are not denying that uh, the molecular structure at the surface of an object uh, determines how light will be reflected, what uh, percentages of incident light will be reflected at various wavelengths. Uh, some of those properties have been called red by other authors. Uh, and uh, if that's what you mean by red, uh, I'm going to call that red too. And uh, uh, those properties are not denied to be instantiated by illusionists. The red that is denied to be instantiated in our world by illusionists. I'm going to call that one Red One. All right. Now, uh, what's the problem? Uh, if Red One is not instantiated in our world, uh, how can we talk about it? All right. This problem is not, how, how can we even get uh, so far as to coherently say Red one is not instantiated in our world. This problem is not original with me. Sidney Shoemaker uh, gave a clear statement of it in a 1990 paper, and I'm just going to read that. Here's what Shoemaker says. It is a mystery, to say the least, how the content of our experience can include reference to properties whose actual instantiation we have never experienced or had any other epistemic access to, properties we know neither by acquaintance nor by description, unless we have some sort of non-sensory acquaintance with a platonic realm of uninstantiated properties. Now, uh, you, you might be thinking, uh, wait a minute, what, what's the problem? We, we represent non-instantiated properties all the time, right? For example, we have no problem uh, representing uh, unicorns or representing instances of, of the property being a unicorn, right? So, you know, what's, what's the problem? Uh, the problem is this. Uh, let, let's think about unicorn. We're able to represent unicorns uh, because we already have representations of some things that do exist. Uh, there are horses, uh, there are horns, there is a relation of growing out of, branches grow out of trees, right? Uh, and we can uh, 
uh, use the, uh, these properties in uh, imaginative rearrangement to construct the property of being a unicorn. To tell a parallel story uh, for Red One or for Red One experiences, uh, we'd have to tell a story that goes like this. There are actually instantiated, presumably physical entities X, Y, Z, uh, and there is a set of physical relations R uh, such that uh, when X, Y, Zs stand in that set of relations, uh, one has either Red One or a Red One experience. Now, the problem for that account uh, is that we don't have one that is plausible. But more importantly for today's talk, even if we had one, uh, we would not have illusionism, right? If we really thought that we could give a, a, you know, a really good account of what a red one experience was by saying there are certain XYZs and when they stand in ours, that's what a, that would be a, a red experience. If we really thought that we could do that, then we should say that our experiences give us wonderful evidence that there are such XYZs standing in relation to R. That would be uh, a, a physicalist experiential realism, not illusionism. All right, uh, so uh, maybe we could just uh, summarize uh, Shoemaker's point, elaborate a, a little bit. Uh, uh, how, how is it possible for us to represent properties that are never instantiated in our world and, uh, and for which we have no construction in the manner of constructing the property of unicorn? All right, uh, let's turn to some responses. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Paraboom's response. Uh, Paraboom quotes the passage of Shoemaker that I just read. And immediately thereafter, he gives a response. And I'm going to read that response. Uh, but before I do, I, I need to note that Perboom uses the term phenomenal redness. Uh, but he doesn't mean by that what, what some other authors might well be taken to mean by it. Uh, what Perboom seems to have in mind by phenomenal redness is uh, a brain event property, a property of brain events uh, whose instantiation would co-vary with such things as seeing uh, bullfighters' capes or uh, seeing ripe strawberries and so on. All right, with that clarification, here's uh, Pear Boom's response to Shoemaker. I prefer to resist the epistemological picture that Shoemaker assumes. We are familiar with the qualitative nature that we misrepresent phenomenal redness as having just because of the way our introspective system represents phenomenally red states. And thus there is no need for this qualitative nature to be instantiated for us to become familiar with it. Or else we become familiar with the qualitative nature we misrepresent redness as having just because of the way our visual system represents red things. It is ways things are represented that would fundamentally provide us with access to this qualitative nature, even if it turns out that they misrepresent things with the consequence that there isn't anything that has this nature. Now, the term representation uh, is used liberally in this passage of Pear Booms. But that passage just assumes that representation talk makes sense. There is nothing in it that explains how representation of never instantiated and non-constructed properties is possible, right? The, this, this passage does not really uh, come to grips. It does not really engage Shoemaker's problem. So let's move on to Keith Frankish. Frankish, uh, uh, this is a 2016 paper, uh, Frankish uh, explicitly recognizes the problem that Shoemaker raised. Uh, here, here's a quote. 
If there are no phenomenal properties, how do we represent them? Now, uh, Frankish gives a number of uh, possible answers to this question, uh, and, and he rejects several uh, for various reasons. Uh, I think his uh, rejections are correct, so I, I'm not going to go through all that. Uh, I'm just going to focus on uh, Frankish's own proposal, positive proposal. Uh, it's a complicated view. Uh, he calls it a hybrid view. But there's a piece of it uh, that is essential to the hybrid view, uh, and I'm just going to focus in on that. Uh, I'm going to read what Frankish advises us to do, is to adopt some form of functional role semantics for phenomenal concepts on which their content is fixed by their role in mental processing including their connections to other concepts, to non-conceptual sensory and introspective representations, their own content determined causally or functionally, and to associations, behavioral dispositions, and so on. Now, the trouble with this is it assumes that there are non-conceptual sensory representations that can have their content determined causally or functionally. But now, wait a minute. If, if red one or red one experience, if those properties are never instantiated in our world, they cannot enter into causal relations. And if they can't enter into causal relations, uh, they cannot be tracked. Tracking is uh, a mainstay of accounts of representation, but tracking is a causal notion. Right? You can't have tracking if you don't have instantiated properties. You can't even get covariance with a property that is never instantiated. How about uh, uh, functionally? Well, to put things very generally, to perform a function is to occupy a position in a network of relations. But if red one or red one experience is never instantiated, then it cannot occupy a, a position in a set of relations that are instantiated in our world. So my conclusion about Frankish is that, uh, once again, Representation is uh, not explained. Representation of not instantiated and non-constructible properties uh, is not explained. So finally, I'll move on to Kammerer. Now, uh, Kammerer's paper is very complicated and uh, extremely ingenious. But fortunately for this talk, uh, there's uh, a piece of it that we can focus on that uh, that uh, shows an inadequacy in the view. As background to uh, that part of uh, our discussion, uh, <clears throat> I should uh, identify the task that Kammerer sets himself. It's to explain why illusionism seems absurd, even after we understand the reasons for it. All right. There have been many uh, uh, changes in the history of thought that have been, in their way, quite radical, right? but that have not been regarded as absurd once it was made clear what the revision was. Right? But with illusionism, even after we understand the view, it, it, it seems impossible. Why is that? That's Cameron's problem. Now, his explanation of that problem is to say that we have a theory of mind module. It's the modularity that explains the persistence of the resistance to accepting illusionism. It's in the very nature of a module that the principles that the module operates on cannot be changed by 
cognitive process, processes that go on outside the module. All right. Now that's the explanation of the resistance to illusionism. But of course, uh, it, it won't be an explanation of resistance to illusionism unless the principles that our theory of mind module is supposed to work on are at odds with what the illusionist view is. So let's ask, what, what is it that's in our theory of mind module that we're committed to by the, you know, by the operation of the module? And here's the answer. Our theory of mind module makes us, quote, intuitively think of experiences as resembling the primitive qualities that they present external objects as possessing, though we judge that objects do not really possess such qualities. So, yes, Kammerer disagrees with his alleged theory of mind module. Kammerer doesn't think there are experiences that resemble primitive qualities that they present objects as having. Kammerer doesn't believe that. But his theory of mind module represents primitive qualities, and it represents resemblance between experiences and uh, primitive qualities. How can the theory of, module, theory of mind module do such a thing? That is not explained. That remains a mystery. My conclusion from uh, examination of these authors is that representation of properties that are never instantiated in our world and not uh, constructed by us, representation of those properties remains a mystery. I think there's a serious problem for illusionism. I think illusionists would like to get rid of qualia because qualia are thought to be mysterious, irreconcilable with physicalism, but they have not removed the mystery. All they've done is to relocate it and leave us with a mysterious notion of representation. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope there will be some questions. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Saffron. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at Indiana University. And today I will describe a synthetic theory of consciousness I recently proposed and published in Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence. It's called Integrated World Modeling Theory, or IWMT for short. And uh, it's a somewhat complicated theory, uh, but I'll do the best I can to provide a high-level overview. For more details, I refer you to the publication, which is free to read online. Uh, I also have a companion preprint, uh, Integrated World Modeling Theory Revisited, where I go into additional issues that I did not have uh, space to address in the main publication. So the goal of Integrated World Modeling Theory is to make headway on the enduring problems of consciousness all of them. And towards this end, what I do is I cross-reference many of the leading models of consciousness, and there's many of them, and I specifically focus on integrated information theory and global neuronal workspace theory. And what I do is I try to look at what are the areas of overlap between these theories? What are the areas of convergence? How are they similar? While at the same time noting the differences and considering what those differences might imply. So in this integration attempt, the way in which I bring these theories together is within an overarching framework of the free energy principle and active inference as pioneered by Carl Friston and colleagues, which is gaining increasing popularity and controversy as potentially the first unified paradigm for understanding mind and life. In a very brief nutshell, the free energy principle states that persisting systems must be doing something somewhat intelligent in order to persist in a world governed by the second law of thermodynamics or a world in which you would expect all things 
to get all mixed up and evolve towards states of maximal disorder. So how is it that this maximally probable outcome is avoided? The free energy principle states that persisting systems in some sense must entail predictive models within their dynamics that helps to regulate these dynamics and exchanges with the environment so that the systems can hold themselves together, self-generate, self regenerate, and not dissipate. Uh, the free energy idea is it's an information theoretic objective function uh, which you use to characterize how good are these models. Um, within the free energy principle, there's uh, a more specific process theory of the active inference framework, or what must systems do in order to minimize their free energy or their prediction error. Uh, there's even more specific ideas related to predictive processing or predictive coding in the Bayesian brain. And in the paper, I try to show how all of these things uh, hang together, and I try to give an explanation and review of these things. With respect to the Bayesian brain, uh, in brief, the idea is that perception is a kind of inference to the best guess as to the causes of sensory observations, so that your perceptual experience is actually a kind of prediction or probabilistic inference of what you think is in the world. Uh, this, to justify this idea, um, one part of it would be that your sensation is actually fairly impoverished and ambiguous. You only have visual acuity of about a thumbnail held out at arm's length. Uh, further, even within that region, a good chunk of it is taken up by the blind spot. Yet, that's not how your perception seems. There seems to be some sort of additional filling in process, this generation of additional information uh, that's more complete than you would expect given uh, your sensations. Uh, now, the exact, exact extent of how rich this is and how much filling in occurs is a matter of some debate, but the idea is that some kind of additional abduction or probabilistic inference is allowing you to infer a more complete sensorium from your sense data. So this idea is gaining increasing traction in light of the rise of deep learning and the success that it's been encountering recently in artificial intelligence. So in the past, people would focus more on discriminative models that are trained in a supervised fashion where you show them a bunch of stimuli, you tell them what the stimuli are, and then these systems are capable of telling you a hypothesis of what different stimuli constitute. So I can train up these networks on a bunch of Google images, and then I can ask it, am I looking at a dog or a cat or a face or what kind of face? Now, with respect to consciousness, the more recent developments in deep learning involve an inversion of these generative models or the opposite direction of inference. Rather, instead of going from data to a hypothesis of what you're seeing, you go from your hypotheses or your models of what you expect and then generate likely patterns of data. So on the right there, you can see the output of an early generation generative adversarial network um, producing images of faces that don't exist in reality but seem likely based on the training data. And more recent incarnations of these technologies, uh, it's really amazing what they can achieve. Uh, it's so amazing, in fact, that um, these form the basis for these deep fake images where you can't even tell the difference between whether this was a real or a fake image. So this type of mapping, this type of computational principle, the relationship between a probabilistic network or a neural network and the entailed probability distributions or models of these networks, this mapping, I propose, and others, that is a bridging principle that we can use to go between brain and mind. But with respect to consciousness, rather than just the filling in of, let's say, visual images of like these faces, what 
you would be doing is your brain functioning as a probabilistic generative model would be filling in your entire sensorium, your sight, your sound, your touch, and this filling in over time of likely sense data for everything you experience would be the processes that give rise to your consciousness as a kind of inference or prediction. Uh, this idea has been discussed as uh, your consciousness constituting a kind of uh, grounded hallucination or a, a waking dream or a kind of fully immersive virtual reality. And I'd say that's all right, and that's the basic idea. But, but with integrated world modeling theory, I try to make some more specific claims. I specifically uh, draw upon this distinction as Ned Block proposed between phenomenal consciousness and axis consciousness. Um, specifically, I take phenomenal consciousness to be experience, what it is like or what it feels like, or subjectivity or a point of view in the world. I consider access consciousness or a consciousness to be awareness, knowledge of your experience, or the manipula manipulability and reportability of the information of your experience. And this distinction, I think, is important because uh, with respect to these different models of consciousness, oftentimes I believe they're talking past each other because they're using terminology different. They're, they're referring to different aspects of consciousness or different kinds of phenomena related to consciousness. So with integrated world model theory, the basic claims are this. Um, your phenomenal consciousness is what it is like to be the functioning of a probabilistic generative model for the sensorium of an embodied embedded agent. Access consciousness and possibly also phenomenal consciousness requires this information be integrated into a world model with spatial, temporal, and causal coherence for a system and its relationships with its environment. Access consciousness and possibly also phenomenal consciousness further requires self models with autonomy or agency and the ability to engage in counterfactual or imaginative processing. Uh, that's integrated world modeling theory in a nutshell, and the paper goes into far greater detail. In this synthetic model, I draw upon integrated information theory uh, and global neuronal workspace theory. With respect to IIT, um, it can be hard to explain, but in some ways it's fundamentally simple. IIT starts from phenomenology or the nature of experience and tries to identify necessary uh, essential features for all experiences. So your conscious experience has intrinsic existence or it has a perspective, a particular perspective that's from within. It has composition, or there's different things within your consciousness. It has information and in that your consciousness being one way distinguishes it from all the other ways it could be. It's integrated and in that uh, your experience as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And if I were to remove one of the parts, that would be a difference that makes a difference and you would have a different experience. It's also exclusive in that I am conscious of some things and not of others. And these phenomenal axioms are further stipulated to, or other uh, mechanisms are postulated that might be able to realize these properties. And then what integrated information theory does is it tries to characterize different systems by their ability to realize these mechanisms and then tries to characterize their potential for being sources of consciousness. IIT also has generated a lot of controversy. Uh, specifically, uh, if those conditions, those axioms are considered to be jointly sufficient for consciousness, then some of the entailments are things like quasi-panpsychism. Uh, IIT theorists have argued that um, things like uh, 2D grids of uh, logic gates, even if they're not referring to anything, could be highly conscious. Or you might have minimal consciousness associated with a single photodiode or an elementary particle. Uh, I believe that by treating the axioms as 
potential is potentially necessary but not sufficient for consciousness, you end up sidestepping much of this controversy. And in terms of what would allow us to be have sufficiency, I argue you need coherence. With you need that these IIT analyses must apply to systems capable of generating world models with coherence with respect to space, time, and cause for the system and its relationships to the world. And so a, th a system could in theory have an arbitrarily large amount of integrated information, but there still might not be anything that it's like to be such a system unless it was given this kind of embodied grounding that it could bring forth an integrated world model. So in addition to integrated information theory, I also draw upon global neural workspace theory which is quite different from IIT in, in, in terms of rather than starting from axioms of experience, it starts from what are the functional or computational properties of consciousness? GNWT argues that consciousness involves the global access and broadcasting of information via these ignition events or these synchronous complexes where information from otherwise isolated specialist processes or modules are by becoming taken up into these large-scale re-entrance signaling complexes, are, you get the formation of a temporary global workspace where the information can be made globally available and uh, achieve what Dennett calls fame in the brain. And in more recent uh, versions of GNWT, these ideas have been explicitly described in terms of uh, Bayesian or probabilistic inference where these uh, Ignition events where workspaces form are thought of as basically the um, selecting of a winning interpretation of what's going on in the world, of a winning model uh, relative to a range of alternatives. And I think this is basically right. And so I try to bring together IIT and GNWT as both capturing essential properties of consciousness but in different ways. And so uh, IIT and GNWT, um, they're currently uh, in some ways like at each other's throats with debates and there's this adversarial collaboration starting up to see uh, which is the good theory. Um, I think this is good that this is happening, although uh, I think part of it, what we might expect is rather than one theory being right, and the other theory being wrong, it might be that they're both right, but they're right about different things. Specifically, integrated information theory argues that consciousness, the physical substrates of it, are located with a posterior hot zone at the back of the brain, while GNWT argues that conscious access involves frontal lobes, needs the frontal lobes to be involved in order to achieve this global availability of information. And the ability to have knowledge of it and report on it. I think these are both correct statements and they're talking about different things. IIT, I argue in the manuscript, is talking about phenomenal consciousness and I agree that it is pro likely primarily generated in the back of the brain, specifically posterior medial cortices, uh, in particular the precuneus as the mind's eye or the Cartesian theater, if you will and the inferior parietal lobule, specifically the uh, angular gyrus and supramarginal gyrus as a source of um, body schemas or your body, the generation of body sensations your, as felt in all of its different aspects, and also your attentional or intentional awareness state. Uh, and this has relevance to attention schema theory. And so if you bring together your attention schemas, your body schemas, and this visual model of the world, and you have them all integrated, I argue that this is what generates your consciousness. This is basic phenomenal consciousness. Although I also argue that GNWT is correct with respect to the frontal lobes being important for access consciousness or to have higher order knowledge of this experience. Yet, the experience itself, in line with IAT, I argue, is always generated in the back of the brain. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the, how the adversarial collaboration unfolds, um, and whether we find that one theory is right or one theory is wrong, 
are that they're both right in different ways, which is what I claim. Integrated world modeling theory is ambitious in its scope. I try to show how the free energy principle and integrated information theory can be combined and how both of these can be combined with global neuronal workspace theory to explain consciousness. Uh, I go into further details about computational principles uh, from machine learning architectures that might be relevant for understanding how it is that the brain functions as a generative model that could give rise to experience. I also focus on relevant neural systems and in particular uh, talk about ways that neural synchrony, particularly at alpha frequencies or 8 to 12 times a second, might be integrating information across your entire sensorium to create an integrated world model from a, a coherent egocentric perspective providing a point of view on the world. With respect to the role of synchrony, I address or draw upon Cell and Adesoy's Connectome Harmonics uh, framework. And I discuss some additional theories of consciousness and the potential functional significance of consciousness. So with integrated world modeling theory, I make a fairly bold claim, which is that the hard problem might not be nearly as hard as we thought. Uh, rather, we just needed to wait to have the right bridging principles as made available by advances in probability theory and machine learning to help us understand the types of computational processes that would be involved in the generation of consciousness. And we also needed to remember or remind ourselves of the inherently embodied nature of conscious experience, that what we are conscious of is experience and our experience is fundamentally embodied. So I'm, in moving forward, I'm going to more details on uh, the ways that different neural systems contribute to different aspects of consciousness, including with respect to intentional goal-oriented behavior. And that's what I've attempted to do. And I'm very curious to know what people think. So uh, if any of you read the paper and have any questions or opinions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Hello, colleagues, friends. What a pity we don't get to meet in person this time around. I hope you're well and safe wherever you are and I thank the organizers for putting together this online meeting so that at least we can exchange some ideas in this format. I also thank the funders, in particular the Fetzer Franklin Fund, who also funded my own work to a very large extent. My name is Nicholas von Stilfried. Uh, I'm with Fino Science Laboratories in Berlin, Germany, and I'm a neuroscientist by training. I've been working for the last 15 years or so at the intersection of quantum theory, neuroscience and philosophy. Uh, deeply fascinated by the phenomenon of consciousness and hooked by the search for a theory to explain it. Um, among the, the many different approaches towards a, a theory of consciousness uh, that I've familiarized myself with, uh, Rosalian monism appears as one of the most promising ones to me. I don't um, share so much the, the doubts recently voiced by some authors that the combination problem uh, could present a grave, if not a fatal, challenge to uh, pan protopsychist uh, theories such as Rosalian monism, because I believe that the um, combinatorial mechanism inherent in the wave aspects of quanta adequately addresses the core aspects of the combination issue. Uh, I presented uh, this analysis at last year's conference in Interlaken, by the way, so if you're interested, 
uh, you can take a look at the abstract there. This time around, I'd like to share with you some uh, recent thinking on another aspect of Russellian monism, uh, namely its response to the phenomenal judgment problem and how that response could possibly be further improved by taking into account uh, aspects of another proposal for the theory of consciousness, which comes from physicist and philosopher uh, David Bohm, and uh, which I would classify as a kind of quantum wave consciousness identity theory. Uh, definitely another of my favorites uh, among the existing proposals toward a theory of consciousness. So I'll start out by uh, giving an outline of the phenomenal judgment problem as I understand it and the standard response of Russellian monism and then I'll introduce that proposal by David Bohm and show how uh, some aspects of it could be gleaned to strengthen the Russellian monist's uh, response. Uh, and then I put out the question if there could even be a, a fusion of these proposals uh, speculating about some potential benefits of such a combined approach and uh, also pointing to some major questions that uh, would have to be answered um, in, in, in further exploring this idea. Uh, my take-home message today is uh, not so much uh, any um, particular um, conviction uh, but uh, rather um, that I find it uh, generative and fruitful in many ways to consider the, the fields of quantum theory and theory of consciousness as uh, relevant for each other. And that the proposal by David Bohm is an interesting and definitely under-researched idea uh, of potentially uh, great pertinence to other discourses uh, current in the analytic philosophy of mind community. So, let's get started. Uh, what is the phenomenal judgment problem? I'm using David Chalmers' terminology here, obviously. Um, he talks about direct phenomenal belief or second-order phenomenal judgment. Um, and what uh, that means is a situation where, as the result of introspection, someone comes to the conclusion that something phenomenal exists. And this conclusion then involves or is accompanied by a physical process. For example, uh, I introspect right now, and as a result, I arrive at the conviction, and then I express that conviction, that I am experiencing a phenomenal state right now. I am conscious. There is experiencing of qualia going on right here, right now. Now, what we have here is uh, physical processes occurring, neuron firing, muscle movements, vocal cord vibrations, movement of air molecules, etc. And these physical processes somehow very clearly correlated to a phenomenal state, at least semantically referring to a phenomenal state. And experientially, uh, of course, um, even uh, caused by that phenomenal state. Um, this situation, the, this instance of phenomenal judging, direct phenomenal judging, um, allows to very sharply focus on the different ways in which different proposals uh, for a theory of consciousness conceptualize and explain this correlation between phenomenal going-ons and physical going-ons. Uh, now, regarding the um, response of Russellian monism, 
to that problem. Uh, one of the things I, I value most about Rosellimism is that it manages to propose not only a lawful, but maybe even a logically stringent relation here, namely that between intrinsic substance and relational property, relata and relations. This, in my view, uh, holds the promise of a beautiful synthesis of dualist and monist thinking, and even further, it could also to some extent combine the intuitions that drive epiphenomenalism and interactionism by postulating a two-way uh, mutual dependency or, or formative relevance between phenomenal and physical that does not, however, require any transfer of force or changes in energy balance or, or the like. So no physical laws need to be tempered with by the phenomenal because basically physical laws are constituted by the phenomenal. The physical is basically the relational properties of the phenomenal or proto-phenomenal substance. All right, so that is a great and, and promising achievement of Rosellian monism, I find, but it still leaves much of the details to be fleshed out. Uh, for example, uh, as much as this substance property relation may be logically and intuitively convincing, it remains somewhat unclear what it means concretely, like how exactly does the protophenomenal substance define fundamental physical properties and vice versa. How, how should we really think about this? Uh, and at this point, um, I would like to introduce very shortly this proposal by David Bohm uh, that he first published in the 1980s in a paper called A New Theory of the Relationship of Mind and Matter. Uh, you can find the reference in the abstract. Uh, this was also published um, as one of the chapters uh, of Bohm's well-known book, The Undivided Universe. Uh, but nevertheless, it has, to my knowledge, not been discussed in much depth in the philosophy of mind community, with uh, the very notable exception, of course, of the writings of Pavel Pilkanen, uh, which I highly recommend. And I feel that uh, this idea should definitely receive uh, wider attention because it points in a, um, what I feel uh, could be a, a very interesting and potentially very fruitful direction. At the core of the proposal uh, is the idea that the wave aspect of quanta should be uh, conceived of as, uh, in Bohm's words, the rudimentary mental pole of quanta. And to be more precise, uh, it, it is uh, the quantum potential um, that is given this, um, what in, in uh, current wording we would uh, probably rephrase as uh, protophenomenal property. Uh, and the, the quantum potential is that part of the uh, quantum wave that determines particle locations and trajectory. Uh, so essentially, um, the view that results from this proposal is a pan-protophenomenality inherent in the uni universal wave, uh, from which follows then the possibility for full-blown phenomenal states to emerge under suitable uh, conditions, of course, in, in certain portions of that universal wave, namely uh, those subsets of the universal wave that uh, pertain to 
uh, systems composed of quanta, obviously, um, that are conscious. And further, the conditions under which the phenomenal referent of a phenomenal judgment uh, emerges from the protophenomenal precursor substance can then be lawfully identical to the conditions under which um, the physical process constituting the phenomenal judgment emerges from the uh, fundamental physical properties of the quanta, uh, which uh, the system which makes the judgment is composed of. Uh, obviously, Bohm uh, makes this proposal uh, against the backdrop of the De Broglie Bohm uh, pilot wave or, or guiding wave interpretation of quantum theory. But as far as I can see, it, it would work uh, with other interpretations too. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in a very up to date discussion um, by many high caliber physicists um, of the Bohmian interpretation of quantum theory and its relation to, to other interpretations, I highly recommend the proceedings and recordings of the conference series EMQM, Emergent Quantum Mechanics, which you can find uh, and access freely on the web. So coming back to that uh, Bohmian proposal, what can be gained from it uh, for Rossellian monism, in particular in the context of uh, explaining the correlations between phenomenal and physical going on. So, uh, first of all, I believe it's worthwhile to consider the wave-particle particle wave relation when thinking and talking about ways in which to conceive the phenomenal physical physical phenomenal relation. Because the way in which the quantum wave shapes physical reality by influencing uh, quantum particle locations and vice versa, quantum particles influencing the shape of the quantum wave, um, without expanding or transmitting energy, is, as far as I know, the only instance of such a mechanism of non-causal influence that is uh, known in physics. So, in this way, uh, some flesh may be added to the bone of uh, any proposal that postulates a similar non-causal influence between phenomenal and physical and vice versa. Um, a more speculative and, and more radical maneuver, uh, which I briefly want to mention, uh, would be uh, or, or could be uh, a fusion of Rossellian monism and the Bohmian proposal. And uh, one particular avenue that I find interesting to explore in this respect is the question if not the Rossellian substance property relation could be applicable to uh, the wave and particle aspects of quanta. Uh, this would mean that the wave nature of quanta uh, could possibly be considered the intrinsic substance of quanta and the particle nature of quanta the relational properties. Uh, of course, at first sight, this uh, sounds like a very strange proposal because we're so used to uh, think about the quantum wave as a physical object. And um, when we describe it as having uh, different properties at different space-time coordinates, for example, then from a Rossellian point of view, that is clearly a, a relational description. On the other hand, however, it could be that not the entire nature of the quantum wave is characterized by such a uh, relational description. Um, uh, for example, uh, there are some properties of the quantum wave that are so radically different from all properties of all other physical objects um, that uh, this has led to uh, an ongoing debate in physics and in philosophy of physics 
about whether the quantum wave can be considered a physical object at all, or whether a separate ontic category is required. Uh, for example, uh, one of the most astonishing properties of the wave is the degree of absolute self-referentiality that it displays. Uh, all quantum waves are instantaneously interconnected across space and time in the universal wave, and the evolution of this universal wave is completely self-determined, i.e. not influenced by anything other than itself. So this um, could be a pointer um, toward a degree of self-referentiality uh, that we would expect uh, from any candidate for something like intrinsic substance. Obviously, uh, it's, it's way too early to draw any conclusions here. Uh, much, much, much more effort and collective effort is needed to explore this. But um, if um, the wave can be seen as something intrinsic, uh, something absolute, and the particles as relational expressions of this intrinsic uh, substance, then the distinction uh, between waves and particles and the distinction between phenomenal and physical could turn out to be actually one and the same distinction, just from a different perspective. Uh, so the, the universal wave to itself is proto-phenomenal with, with the possibility for full-blown phenomenality to emerge under suitable conditions in, in certain portions of the universal wa wave. Um, and so consciousness then is the, is the inside view of what from the outside uh, looks just like another portion of the universal wave. So from an ontological point of view, this would of course be an extremely parsimonious view with only two ontic categories, namely uh, proto-phenomenal wave and particles in space-time, rather than three, uh, the proto-phenomenal intrinsic substance uh, and its uh, properties, wave-like and particle-like relational properties in space-time, again, of course. Anyway, uh, I don't know whether, uh, of course, uh, um, this idea of such a, a radical fusion um, of these theories will ever cash out into anything useful, but I'd love to explore it further, um, together with you, if you like. Um, I'm more confident about what I said earlier, um, that uh, it, it seems possible to say already at this time that the, the plausibility of Rosalian monism profits from the Bohmian uh, wave consciousness identity proposal and vice versa. Mm. But as I said, um, the purpose of my talk was maybe not so much uh, to push any of these particular views but I hope that I was able uh, to convey a little bit of the, the sense of fascination that I have for the general exploration of uh, the possible intersections between quantum physics and science of consciousness, um, and to bring David Bohm to your attention. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you uh, if you would like to explore any of this further. And or if you have any other comments. And so time's up, uh, and with that, um, I say bye-bye and be well. Hi, my name is Frank Hiley, and I'm going to present a two-agent model of the human brain, which provides an explanation of consciousness. I've developed in this model for more than 20 years. It has significantly changed, and I hope significantly improved over those 20 years of research. I'm also writing a book about this model with a tentative title of Consciousness and Spirituality Explained. 
This talk corresponds to part one of that book, An Explanation of Consciousness. This particular video is a 20-minute summary of a much longer video that I have available on my website, and I will be putting little notes up like this, referring you to that longer video for more information about various features I present here. Here is a list of the forms of conscious awareness that I will be able to explain in this talk. I will explain the distinction between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness, and I'll explain these three types of human consciousness. This explanation is based on three key ideas. The first is the good regulator theorem, which proves that a good agent needs to have a model of the world where the agent operates. Second, I'll propose a two-agent model of the human brain. And third, I'll be using attention schema theory of consciousness proposed by Princeton neuroscientist Michael Graziano. Here's an outline of the talk. And what I'm going to be presenting is a high-level functional model of the brain. It's kind of what you would design if you were going to engineer a brain from scratch. But you can see that we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's dig in and start with descriptions of agents and world models. Now, an agent is an entity that has goals, a way of sensing the world, and a way to make changes to the world to achieve those goals. Humans have lots of goals, and they can be put into three major categories, such as to survive, to reproduce, and to be social. And we can certainly sense the world and change the world. Therefore, a human being is an agent. Now, the good regulator theorem says that every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. A regulator is an agent, and the system is the world where the agent is trying to achieve its goals. Therefore, a good agent needs a model of the world. For this theorem, they have defined a good agent as an agent that is optimally simple and optimally effective. These two requirements here go into the claim that it must be a model of the system. This means there must be a kind of isomorphism, which is a one-to-one -one mapping between the states of the agent and the important states of the world. If you don't meet those requirements of being optimally simple and optimally effective, instead of being a model of the world, you would simply contain a model of the world. So we can assume that humans contain a model of the world. Now, if the agent is part of the world, then the agent needs a self-model. Now, the question is, do we experience the world directly, or do we only experience our model of the world? Well, colors can help answer that question. The way colors work is that the eye sends to the brain the equivalent of these three black and white images of the scene that we're looking at, and the brain takes that information. It's just taking in information, and it produces this colorful image. Those colors do not exist out in the world. They are made up entirely by the brain. Now, some people object, yes, but the colors tell you about the wavelength of light that is entering the eye. Colors are actually more complicated than that, and I'll illustrate that with the color illusion. Now, in this image, the left and right rectangles there don't look like they're the same color. The left one looks like a bluish green, and the right one looks like a yellowish green. However, they really are the same color, which I'll demonstrate by erasing the purple and orange bars over the bottom half of this image. And there you see that you have three different color experiences, and yet exactly the same wavelengths of light are entering your eyes from those three regions. The reason I'm talking about an illusion like this is that I claim that the illusion is the model of the world that we're living in, it is not the actual physical world out there where these would all be the same color of green. Further evidence for this is that what we experience is not what the eye sends to the brain. The problem is that in the human eye, the visual acuity is very high in the center of vision, but it drops off rapidly as you move out from that center of vision. And yet we don't see the world as being blurry in the periphery. The reason we don't see that is because we experience the world model. And the world model knows that the entire scene is crisp and in focus. It knows this because you've looked around in scenes before and you never experienced blurriness in an area where the eye is sending a blurry image to the brain. Another piece of evidence from vision comes from rapid eye saccades. A saccade is when you move the center of vision from one fixation point to another fixation point very rapidly. It turns out that while you are moving your eye there, you are blind, and we do not experience that blindness. Furthermore, between the beginning and the end of the saccade, the image that's on the retina shifts by a large amount as the eye moves. And yet we don't experience the world moving. We, we experience that the world is stationary. So you don't experience what the eye is sending to the brain. You only experience the world model. Furthermore, I claim that sensory experiences are completely arbitrary. For example, in vision, there are three kinds of photoreceptors in the eye, and those photoreceptors are sending their signals to neurons in the brain 
that are processing those particular kinds of signals. And that eventually gives you either the red, green, or blue color experience. Now, if we could magically go into the optic nerve and swap the neurons around there, then when you experience a surface that used to be blue, you will now experience it as red. This shows that the arbitrary colors that we see out in the world there are made up by the brain. They do not exist as a property of anything in the world. And in fact, each sensory experience is an arbitrary label for a particular property or aspect of the model of the world. For example, the red, green, and blue visual experiences are approximate labels for the wavelength of light in the model of the world. And the experience of our own body is the experience of our own self-model in that model of the world. All of this leads us to conclude that we are human self-models living in and experiencing the model of the world. Now, it's commonly said that perception is about identifying and interpreting sensory information. I think a better definition is that perception is the experience of our world model. So let's go on to the two-agent model of the human brain. The two agents are the controller and the modeler. All the inputs to the human are on the left here, so the sensory inputs and language inputs are on the left. The control of the body and the language outputs are on the right. And the modeler is the agent that constructs the model of the world. It does this by taking the sensory inputs and updating the sensory world model. It can also take the language inputs and update the abstract conceptual world model. Now, these are not two separate world models. It's really a continuum going from low-level sensory concepts up to the high-level concepts that we use in language. Now, the only action that the modeler takes is to direct attention. The modeler also includes intuition and the goals and the self-models of all three of these agents. On the other hand, the controller is the agent that controls the body and produces the language output, and it also produces the inner voice and inner visualizations that we experience. Now, if a part of you is wondering, what is that inner voice that he's talking about there? That's it. That was your inner voice. Now, we can also have conscious visualizations where we imagine something is happening in the world. Now, I'm going to refer to these as just thoughts, and these are the conscious thoughts, which can either be verbal thoughts or visual thoughts. The controller also produces all the feelings and emotions that, that we experience. And finally, when the modeler is directing attention, what it's doing is it's trying to find out what are the most important parts of the world right now, and it's trying to ship that information over to the controller through this interface. Directing attention to an object results in the experience of awareness of that object. Now, this is the focal attention mechanism that gives us the focal awareness experience. And here's an example of focal attention. Now, the main way we direct visual focal attention is by moving our center of vision onto the object that we want to be aware of. But you can also direct peripheral visual attention, and I'll demonstrate that here. If you keep your eyes on that green star in that center house in this image, without moving your eyes, try to identify what the color is of the house to the right of that star. Now try to identify the color of the house to the left of the star. You should have been able to experience yourself directing visual attention to the right and to the left to recognize that the, right, the house on the right is blue and the house on the left is a yellow and orange. Now there are two models involved in this focal attention mechanism. And this focal attention mechanism is a very complicated mechanism. It probably uses billions and billions of neurons in the brain over a widely distributed network throughout the brain and the good regulator theorem says that in order to control this focal attention mechanism, the modeler needs a model of that mechanism. And the focal attention schema is exactly the simplified model of the focal attention mechanism that's required. Now, this focal attention schema includes, for example, the modality of the sensory input, or if it's the inner voice or feelings, those are also modalities. It can involve the location of the targets if they were locations in the visual world or locations on the body. And it could also be any specific features you attend to, like the color of an object or the shape of an object or the texture of an object. And then there is the actual focal model, which is the contents of awareness. So the two models in this focal attention mechanism are the focal attention schema and the focal model. Now let's look at what that focal attention schema looks like. When you were keeping your center of vision on that center house, your center of vision fo focal attention schema, which is this black arrow, is centered on that house. When you directed some peripheral attention to the house on the right, there was an arrow to the right. And the house on the left, there's an arrow to the left, then back to the center again. So that's how your focal attention schema changed. Now, the world model didn't change as you directed focal attention around like that. What did change is the focal model. 
When you were on the center house, you had just an image of the center house, essentially. When you included the house on the right, you had more information about that. When you include the house on the left, you have more information about that. So that's how the focal model and the focal attention schemas are related. Now, the focal attention schema is a simplified model of the focal attention mechanism. And the focal attention mechanism gives us the focal awareness experience. A preview of attention schema theory is that the focal attention schema is a simplified model of the focal awareness experience. You can see that this statement almost follows as a logical consequence of the two previous statements. Now let's talk about a different kind of awareness. Again, keep your center of vision on that green star in the, in the center house there. Now drop that focal attention on that house, keeping your eyes centered on the house, and instead pay attention to the entire screen, all the houses on the screen at the same time. Now expand it out to beyond the edges of the screen to all the objects in the room that you're in right now. You can experience there's a diffuse awareness of that entire room. And yet, if you try to describe any of those objects that are out in the periphery, take, pick an object that's outside of the screen and try to think about it to yourself and describe it to yourself. What is that object? What is it? What color is it? What shape is it? Things like that. You'll find that you can only do that if you direct focal attention to that object. So this is diffuse awareness. Now remember that the focal attention mechanism had a focal attention schema and focal models. I'm proposing that a diffuse attention mechanism has a diffuse attention schema and a world model. So this is the first hypothesis about the diffuse attention schema that is similar to the focal attention schema of the focal awareness world. So we now have four objects all together, and these objects constitute the complete world of the modeler. So the modeler constructs the world model, it constructs the focal model, and it has the two different attention schemas as models of the two different attention mechanisms. Similarly, we would say that the diffuse attention schema is a simplified model of the diffuse attention mechanism, and the diffuse attention mechanism gives us the diffuse awareness experience, and we can extend attention schema theory to say that the diffuse attention schema is a simplified model of the diffuse awareness experience. It turns out that there are two types of focal attention. Top-down focal attention is when the attention target is chosen by the controller. Bottom-up focal attention is when the attention target is chosen by the modeler. My second hypothesis about the diffuse attention mechanism is that it is the mechanism that finds the bottom-up attention targets. So we have two functions for this diffuse attention mechanism, and I'm proposing a third hypothesis, which is that it also updates the world model based on the current sensory inputs. The justification for saying that all three of these are implemented by the same diffuse attention mechanism is that all three of these functions require that attention is paid to the entire world model. So let's talk about these attention mechanisms now. So in the modeler's complete world, there's the focal attention mechanism that implements those two functions. And the focal attention schema is a model of the focal attention mechanism, which means that it also models those functions that are being performed. Then there's the diffuse attention mechanism that implements those three functions. And the diffuse attention schema is a simplified model of that mechanism. And it's also a model of those three functions. So let's look at how the diffuse attention schema updates the world model. My hypothesis is that this diffuse attention schema is continuously scanning the sensory input and detecting objects in that input, and then it's comparing the objects that it finds there to the objects in the world model. If they're the same, then nothing happens. But if there's some difference, such as this red flashing square, the associated diffuse attention schema arrow for that location in the world model will get activated. The first thing that happens is it copies the new object to the world model. And now that finishes the updating the world model mechanism, and it goes on to the finding bottom-up focal attention targets. Now, it may be that this is an innocuous change here and nothing, no focal attention needs to be directed to that object, in which case the diffuse attention schema error would just become deactivated again. However, if this is a significant change, then the diffuse attention schema will be copied over to the focal attention schema, and that new changed object will be copied over to the focal model. Now notice that the diffuse attention schema stays activated even when I got copied over to the focal attention schema. That's because the diffuse attention schema is also keeping track of all the focal attention targets. So that red and black arrow there would also have to have activated arrows in the diffuse attention schema. And then finally, the focal attention schema and the focal model are, are what's shared between the modeler and the controller. So that's what goes across that interface between the two. So you could essentially say that the focal attention mechanism spans from the modeler to the controller. Now the diffuse attention mechanism is confined entirely to the modeler, and therefore only the modeler can have diffuse awareness, 
but both the controller and the modeler can have focal awareness. This model of awareness can explain why we can only be aware of senses, the inner voice and visualizations, and the feelings and emotions. Basically, this has to do with the diffuse attention schema arrows and the world model. This model explains why all the other brain processes are completely unconscious. The full explanation of this is available in the long video on the website. So let's go back to look at attention schema theory. In order to apply the attention schema theory to an agent, we need to have the agent's self-models. So let's look at those self-models. The controller self-model has two parts. In the abstract conceptual world model, it is the I, me, my concept. And in the sensory world model, it is the body schema. The modeler self-model also has two parts. In the focal awareness world, it is the focal attention schema. And in the diffuse awareness world, it is the diffuse attention schema. A full explanation of this is available in the long video on the website. So we can make a chart of the self-models. Attention schema theory says that these two different attention schemas are all awarenesses. So the modeler's self-model is awareness itself. Whenever you experience awareness, you are experiencing your own modeler's self-model. Now the human as a whole has some combination of the controller and modeler self-model shown above. Attention schema theory says that an attention schema is essential for awareness. The only agent in this model that has an attention schema at all is the modeler. Therefore, the modeler is the only agent that is aware all by itself. In order to get three conscious agents, we need to combine the modeler with the other agents to get a conscious agent for the controller and for the human as a whole. So the modeler all by itself is conscious and we would use the modeler's self-model of awareness when we are applying attention schema theory to the modeler. The controller would be combined with the modeler, and we would use the controller's self-model when we are applying attention schema theory to the controller consciousness. The human consciousness would be a combination of the controller and modeler's consciousness, and we would use a human self-model that would be a combination of the controller and modeler's self-models in various proportions. So, since the modeler is the only agent that's conscious all by itself, let's define fundamental consciousness as the modeler's consciousness. The distinction between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness is that phenomenal consciousness is experience. It is the phenomenally conscious aspect of a state, which is what it's like to be in that state, i.e. the qualia. Qualia is a term invented by philosophers to describe the experience of the red of, of sunset or the pain of a headache. Access consciousness is the availability for use in reasoning and in guiding speech and action. Only the controller reasons, speaks, and acts, so only the controller will have access consciousness. I'll also use the terms phenomenal awareness and access awareness interchangeably. The hard problem of consciousness is to explain phenomenal awareness. I claim that phenomenal consciousness only occurs in the modeler and access consciousness only occurs in the controller. So how is it that the controller can report the colors of objects, for example? If our focal model is this apple, how could the controller report the color of that pixel? What happens, I believe, is that the focal model is not just the image there, but it's also everything that the modeler knows about the objects in that image. For example, it would note there's a pixel type object here which has a, a color of lime green, and this is the word label for that color property. And at the same time, the modeler would have the experience label of that experience of the lime green color. So for the color property, there are two possible labels, the lime green word label or the, the lime green color experience label. Similar to the object as a whole here would be a green apple object, and this would be the brown stem object. So let's look at the hard problem. From the controller's point of view, I, me, my is looking out through the sense organs and seeing a green apple out there in the world. This green color experience seems like it is out there in the world on the surface of that apple. This is hard to explain. How can an experience exist out in the world? On the other hand, the truth is that information is coming in from the apple and the information goes through the sense organs into the modeler and the modeler constructs a model of that apple. When the modeler directs attention to that apple, 
Attention schema theory would say that the controller would have the awareness of the green color of the apple. But notice that the screen color experience is only in here in the world model. It is not out in the physical world. This is much easier to explain. The green experience is the label for the color property of the object. And everything is completely arbitrary in here. So not only is the green experience made up by the modeler when it's creating the model of the world, but the experience is also made up by the modeler. The experience is a property of the attention mechanism there. The attention arrow there is the, is the, has that property of experience and it's just made up by the modeler. So I don't think this is a really hard problem in this model. This model also has some predictions about the neural correlates of consciousness. And for the access consciousness, it would say that the focal attention mechanism is what should be the neural correlates of consciousness. And that has been measured experimentally. The problem is that the diffuse awareness comes from the updating of the world model and the finding of bottom-up focal attention targets. And these networks would always have constant low levels of activity. That makes them very difficult to detect in an fMRI machine, for example. However, I do have a proposal for measuring the NCCs of phenomenal consciousness if you see a long video. Now, attention schema theory says that the attention schema is a model of awareness. The focal attention schema is a model of focal awareness of the focal model. And the diffuse attention schema is a model of diffuse awareness of the world model. In pictures, the attention schema model would be expressed like this for your focal attention schema and like this for the diffuse attention schema. So let's apply this to our agents looking at objects, concepts, and to the self itself. So the self model is aware of the object, or the self model is aware of the concept, or the self model is aware of the self model itself. For the controller, focal awareness expressed in words, it would say, I am aware of the object, I recognize the concept, I am aware of me. In terms of qualia, it would be the awareness of the object as a sensory experience, or the recognition that the concept is a real concept, or the awareness of the body. These would be the sensory or quality experiences. Now let's look at the modeler's focal awareness models. Here the focal attention schema is the self-model of the modeler. So that's awareness also, and you end up with a lot of awarenesses here. And when you make all the substitutions and figure out what you're actually experiencing, you end up with having a selfless awareness of objects, a selfless recognition of concepts, and a selfless, locationless, objectless awareness of awareness itself. Now, this awareness of awareness can also be expressed as a sense of presence, which is a selfless, locationless, non-physical existence. Now, let's apply the same thing to the modeler's diffuse awareness. Here you have diffuse attention schema is the self-model, which is also diffuse awareness. So when you make all the substitutions, that you're experiencing a selfless awareness of the world model, both when you're trying to experience the world model or when you're trying to experience yourself in that world model. You get exactly the same experience. Now, non-duality is said to occur when one experiences that the self-other distinction is an illusion, and non-duality would certainly apply in this case. An equivalent way of experiencing non-duality is to say that the world and I are one, and again, that experience of non-duality would also occur in this model. So fundamental consciousness is selfless. The focal self-awareness gives a sense of presence, and the diffuse self-awareness gives a sense of non-duality. Let's look at possible human self-models. I claim that the normal modern human identifies completely with the controller. The normal modern human thinks that they control the body, they have all their thoughts, they have all their feelings. It's all about the controller itself. I claim with some meditation practice, some of the modeler's self-model gets mixed in with the controller self-model. After all, meditation tries to control attention and to notice awareness. Now in the flow state, I claim that there's even more of the modeler self-model built in. And the properties of the flow state are exactly what you would expect for an agent that has a lot of model or self-model built into it. And I claim that in more persistent enlightened states have even less of the control or self-model built into them. And therefore, enlightened states would be something like this, where you go to more and more of the model or self-model and less and less of the control or self-model. So the question is, who are you? You would be the normal modern human if you control the body, if you produce speech, thoughts, and feelings, and if you only have focal awareness. If you change from having focal awareness to recognizing that you are awareness, then you are the modern human with meditation practice. In the flow state, your awareness is totally absorbed by the current task, and your actions and awareness are balanced and completely unified. In the enlightened states, you are awareness itself. You are aware of the body moving, of speech, thoughts, and feelings, but you have no sense of agency, because agency only comes from the controller. So fundamental consciousness is the fully enlightened state, 
with a sense of presence and a sense of non-duality. So I've explained these forms of conscious awareness, and that's the end of my part one explanation of consciousness. In the book and in another video, I will go on to part two, which is an explanation of spirituality. What I would do in this model is to rename the modeler as the experiencer. I would also decompose the controller into the thinker and the doer. And this would allow me to explain additional properties and kinds of consciousness, the fundamental differences between humans and animals, a rare neurological condition called autoactivation deficit, and the reason for the development of spirituality and the benefits of spiritual practices. Here's the bibliography for part one. And I welcome feedback. Um, you can contact me through my website. And the most important thing is to click on the sign up now on almost any page of that website. If you do and fill in your email address, I will send a very, very occasional email when there's new content available on the website or when the publication of the book is finally going to be announced. That's it. Thank you for directing your top-down focal attention to this talk. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jakob Mahalik, and I work at the University of Hertfordshire and at the Institute of Philosophy in Prague. According to Penqualityism, a form of Russellian monism defended by Sam Coleman, Michael Lockwood, Russell himself, and others, consciousness is grounded in fundamental qualities, uh, i.e. unexperienced qualia. Despite Penqualityism's significant promise, according to Chalmers, Penqualityism fails as a, as a theory of consciousness, since its reductive approach to awareness of qualities fails to account for the specific phenomenology associated with awareness itself. As I'll explain, however, the existence of this kind of phenomenology, which I'll call awareness phenomenology, is controversial, and so Chalmers' critique is inconclusive. I'll then present a critique of penqualityism that avoids this controversial posit, arguing that penqualityism fails to account for the intimate cognitive access to qualities we're afforded in being aware of them, i.e. for our strong awareness of qualities, as I'll call it. According to Russellian monism, basic microphysical entities, in addition to their standard properties described by physics, also possess fundamental intrinsic properties sometimes called inscrutables, that are pertinent to the production of consciousness. These properties which escape the grasp of physics give Russellian monism a significant advantage over materialism when it comes to Chalmers' hard problem. The question of how the physical brain processes give rise to qualitative consciousness. Where materialism can only appeal to standard physical properties, which arguably have a relational or structural nature, Russellian monists can appeal to intrinsic non-relational inscrutables, which are defined as relevant for consciousness. The nature of inscrutables is contested. According to Russellian panpsychism, inscrutables are primitive phenomenal properties or qualia. Here, phenomenal properties are the properties due to which there's something it's like for one to be in conscious states, examples being the experienced redness of a tomato or the smell of coffee. According to penqualityism, on the other hand, inscrutables are unexperienced qualities. These are to be distinguished from phenomenal properties which entail consciousness. To understand the notion of a quality, recall the experience of a tomato and conceive of the redness presented to you without its being experienced. Using Coleman's slogan, qualities are unexperienced qualia. If individual qualities are unexperienced, how do we become conscious of them? Coleman adopts Rosenthal's approach, uh, according to which we're conscious of a mental state in virtue of having a suitable higher order thought, hot, that we are in that state. Hot structures in my brain, this make me aware of some of the qualities instantiated there. Importantly, this model of awareness allows for physical implementation as it's reducible to structural or relational properties. And qualityism has a significant advantage over Russellian panpsychism as it avoids the subject combination problem of accounting for how micro experiences combine to form unified conscious subjects like ourselves. Since qualities on their own do not involve micro subjects, this problem just doesn't arise in pen qualities. Despite its virtues, pen qualities and faces, according to Chalmers, its own conceivability argument. While the original conceivability argument invokes the conceivability of zombies, 
are physical replicas without consciousness. Uh, the argument can be easily tweaked. Sorry. Uh, the argument can be easily tweaked to involve the conceivability of qualitative zombies or Q zombies, creatures that instantiate all the qualities and structural properties and qualities and posits, and yet are not conscious. Here in this argument, QQ stands for the set of all truths or qualities in conjunction with structural truths, and Q stands for an arbitrary phenomenal truth, such as Jane is phenomenally conscious. Here, premise one, uh, expresses a quality consciousness gap that can be made vivid by invoking the conceivability of Q zombies. The further promises lead us from their conceivability to their possibility, which implies the falsity of pen qualityism. The, the pen qualities are unlikely to question the conceivability possibility link in premise two, as they're typically led to rejection of materialism by this sort of link. Instead, Coleman has recently questioned premise one. Uh, since pen qualities hold that we can conceive of a single quality without their existing consciousness of it, they need to explain how adding structure and organization implies consciousness, blocking premise one. <laughs> Coleman proposes that awareness is reducible to hearts and ultimately to structural properties. Since Q-zombies instantiate both qualities and the required structures, they are, Coleman holds, inconceivable and the argument fails. Chalmers, however, has suggested that awareness involves its own phenomenology, which resists reduction to structural properties. This worry mirrors the thought behind the anti-physicalist conceivability argument, which turns on the claim that organized physical goings-on can't necessitate phenomenology on their own. Supposing that mere organization doesn't necessitate phenomenology as pen qualityists should, and that Chalmers is right in thinking that awareness involves its own specific phenomenology, Coleman ac Coleman's account of awareness must fail. Here Chalmers could invoke uh, accounts of Kriegel or Montague, who of course rely or argue in sophisticated ways for awareness of awareness and associated phenomenology of awareness. Coleman, however, denies that there is awareness phenomenology, holding that awareness, while necessary for phenomenology, does not phenomenologically contribute to it. For him, awareness is a hidden mechanism which makes us conscious of qualities without being itself phenomenally conscious. We call a TV camera shooting a TV show, but not itself appearing in it. For Coleman, we're never aware of awareness, and therefore we lack any awareness phenomenology or how could awareness phenomenology contribute if we're never aware of it? Coleman insists that he doesn't experience any awareness phenomenology and suggests that his proponents just misclassify phenomenology associated with sensory qualities as awareness phenomenology. Particularly prone to misclassification, he suggests are qualities associated with mental effort, with the first order thought I'm aware, or with experiencing oneself as an embodied agent. I think Coleman rightly views awareness phenomenology as controversial insofar as the argument against pen qualityism rely, relies on this sort of phenomenology, then it's controversial too, hence inconclusive. Still, I think Chalmers is right, or Chalmers is onto something in critiquing pen qualityism's reductionism about awareness. The problem is that the pen qualityist view of awareness fails to make sense of the immediate and intimate way in which we're aware of qualities, or so I'll argue. This word is independent of the contested posit of awareness phenomenology. To introduce the worry, I first need to examine Coleman's approach to awareness. While working within the hot framework, Coleman rejects the representationalist form of the hot account, holding that we're aware of a sensory state in virtue of a hot containing the state and thus quoting it. According to this quotational hot or q hot account, we're aware of a quality due to its being presented or quoted by it. The q hots have the following form. Uh, this state is present. Here the quality is embedded in the gap between the quotation marks and in virtue of the embedding, the q hot is about that quality. To see this, recall that the sentence Tom wrote, cat in his notebook, is about the three-letter word cat 
in virtue of containing its token. Akin to picture frames, the function of the cue hearts is to display the quality and thus make us aware of it. Without being displayed, the quality would remain non-conscious. Coleman's view uh, aims to accommodate our sense that in being aware of qualities, we have intimate and direct epistemic access to them. They are, we feel, right there for us. Uh, we are aware of them in a more intimate, intimate sense than that in which we are aware of objects around us. It is the experience, immediacy and intimacy of our access to sensory contents that motivates us to prefer Coleman's QHOT account to the standard HOT account, relying on representation. My worry about QHOT panquotism is based on an objection raised by Joseph Levine against the quotational account of phenomenal concepts endorsed by Caitlin Ballock and others. Uh, Ballock resists the step from the explanatory gap between phenomenal and physical truths to psychophysical dualism by, by accounting for the gap in physical terms. Here, the notion of the explanatory gap captures the fact that physical truths leave phenomenal truths unexplained, and the connection between the two classes of truths appears arbitrary even upon reflection. For Ballock, this gap results from the nature of our direct phenomenal concepts, which we form by directly attending to phenomenal states. According to Ballock, these concepts grant us acquaintance with the phenomenal states they refer, they refer to in providing us with direct and substantial cognitive access to them. Since physical concepts do not afford us acquaintance with their reference, any account of phenomenal states in their terms must appear implausible, reasons Ballock, hence the explanatory gap. Importantly, Ballock suggests that we're acquainted with a phenomenal state in virtue of the states being a physical constituent part of the phenomenal concept of the state. The phenomenal state, the state that serves as its own mode of presentation, presenting itself to the subject. Ballock describes the part-whole relation in terms of realization, suggesting that the phenomenal state is a part of the physical realizer of its phenomenal concept. According to Levine, Ballock's account of acquaintance cannot work. He observes that in being acquainted with phenomenal states, these states are crucially cognitively present for us. Here, cognitive presence signifies a specific cognitive relation which obtains between an organism and its phenomenal state, which is more intimate, more substantive than the kind of relation that obtains between our minds and other items. Levine tells us uh, uh, Levine tells us, this was a quote from Levine, uh, thanks to the, their being cognitively present for us, we know our uh, experiences in a stronger sense than we know, for example, H2O molecules or ordinary objects around us. This intimate relation is, however, left explained by Balak. Levine writes, this is a quote, long quote from Levine, we're still out an account of how physical presence of the phenomenal state in the phenomenal concept alone is responsible for a cognitive presence. That is, how does the presence of the relevant state within the physical impl implementation of the representation become something of which we're aware? Levin suggests that Ballock's account of acquaintance faces a new explanatory gap between truths about the physical presence of a phenomenal state in its phenomenal concept and truths about one's acquaintance with the state. The former just don't explain the latter. Normally, Levine emphasizes only functional states are relevant to its, uh, functional states of a system are relevant to its cognitive properties. These, however, are in principle multiply realizable, which is why the identity of their physical realizers seems irrelevant with respect, seems irrelevant with respect to the system's cognitive properties. It should then be cognitively irrelevant that the phenomenal concept is partly implemented by the phenomenal state it refers to. And so Ballock's model, model doesn't explain acquaintance. This is a powerful challenge for Ballock's account, I think. Since Coleman's account appeals to mental quotation too, and Coleman invokes Ballock's the theory to illustrate his account, I suspect that a related worry applies to it too. Moreover, Levine's wording in the last quoted passage suggests that his worry concerns awareness more generally. Placing the experience um, or the quality in the thought about it or, or in the concept of it just doesn't seem to suffice 
for our intimate awareness of the experience or the quality, or so I will argue. Notably, there are differences between the two accounts. For Balog, phenomenal concepts, quote, experiences, not qualities. That's the main difference. Still, since both accounts aim to make sense of intimate awareness of mental contents in terms of physical containment, the suggestion that a worry based on Levine's challenge applies to q hot and qualitism deserves examine it, examining. The worry can be expressed as follows, as the following simple argument. Premise one, awareness of qualities involves their cognitive presence for us. Premise two, q hot pen qualitism can't account for cognitive presence. Premise three, therefore pen qualitism can't account for awareness. This argument looks valid, but both premises require support. It could be objected against premise one, that the term cognitive presence is too closely associated with acquaintance viewed as one special cognitive relation to her experience, not as a consciousness constituted, re, constituting relation to qualities. Perhaps Levine's work is limited to the cognitive situation of reflecting on consciousness and doesn't ex extend to consciousness constituting awareness of qualities, can be objective. There are, however, good reasons to, reject, uh, to resist this objection. Firstly, notice that in being aware of qualities, we take ourselves to be in an immediate and intimate cognitive relation with them. The experienced redness, for example, appears to be right there for us. We seem to know it intimately and in a substantive sense. This suggests that awareness of qualities involves cognitive presence of qualities for us, and this supports one. Moreover, if this consideration is plausible, cognitive presence doesn't pertain merely to reflection on conscious states, but also to awareness of qualities. The ex experienced redness is intimately present for us without the need for reflection. Secondly, pen qualitists can hardly hold that the conscious states are cognitively present for an organism, but qualities aren't, since they're committed to the view that phenomenology is, is exhausted by the phenomenology associated with the qualities we're aware of. This is a rejection of awareness phenomenology. So cognitive presence of experiences just is cognitive presence of qualities for pen qualities. Thirdly, Levin himself has explicitly construed acquaintance as a relation to sensory qualities and identified it with the relation of conscious awareness. If premise one is true, our awareness of qualities involves cognitive presence of qualities for us. The notion of cognitive presence provides a way to distinguish the strong sense in which we're aware of qualities from the weaker sense in which we're aware of other things. I may be aware of this in this weaker sense of John's sister, even though I have never met her or seen her photo. We can call the cognitive presence involving sense in which we're aware of qualities strong awareness reserving the term weak awareness for awareness which doesn't involve cognitive presence. The terms cognitive presence and strong awareness are thus to be viewed as two sides of a single coin, picking out the same cognitive relation from two opposing angles. If I'm strongly aware of a quality, the quality is cognitively present for me and vice versa. I hope to have rendered premise one plausible. Let me now turn Premise two of the argument, which states that q hot pen qualityism uh, cannot account for the cognitive presence of qualities. In support, it can be argued that the physical presence of a quality in a q hot cannot explain its cognitive presence for the organism. Why, however, hold that? Here, the thought is that one would expect that the cognitive properties of the q hot are exhausted by its intentional properties, and yet the pen qualitists clearly need to hold that they are not so exhausted. Unlike ordinary representing thoughts, after all, the q hot is supposed to ground the cognitive presence of the quality, which really goes beyond the q hot's intentional properties. It was supposed to be the advantage of the q hot account that we, we have more than a thought about. We have more than a thought about the sensory content. Uh, then, however. Pen qualities owe us an account of how the physical presence of the quality in the Q-hot can determine its cognitive properties. It won't help to say that its physical presence partially grounds the thought, the thought's intentional properties. Um, sorry, I'll say that again. It won't help to say that its physical presence partially grounds the thought's intentional properties. 
as it's surely unclear why this fact about how intentional properties of the thoughts are grounded results in the quality's cognitive presence for us. We're thus faced with an explanatory gap between truths about the Q-hot mechanism and facts about the cognitive presence of the quality. This, however, is just another way of expressing premise two. So I take it that premise two is uh, vindicated and that leads us to the conclusion, which is that Tranquilitism can't make sense of, uh, of awareness in the sense in which we're aware of qualities that complete the argument. Appealing to the distinction between strong and weak awareness, where strong awareness is defined as involving cognitive presence, we can also describe premise two of the argument as an explanatory gap between organized qualities and facts about strong awareness. This suggests uh, the following conceivability argument against q hot panqualityism, which uh, can be illustrated in terms of what I call strong awareness zombies, A zombies, are replicas with respect to the qualities instantiated and the structural properties constituting the q hot mechanism, which are not strongly aware of, that, of any quality and thus are non-conscious. Uh, if, however, as I argue, pen qualities are committed to holding that consciousness involves strong awareness of qualities, conceivability of a zombies implies that the pen qualities account of consciousness is lacking and the view fails. This means to conclude uh, that the real worry for pen qualityism does not root from awareness phenomenology, but rather from the special intimate way in which we are, we are aware of quality. So the full version of this presentation can be found in our Kentness. Uh, here is my email. And thank you very much for your attention.